Because if your goal's a blue belt, you'll get the blue belt and you'll leave. If your goal's a black belt, you get your black belt, you leave. And the journey starts again at black belt, I'm telling you, man. It's a whole different view of the world. You reach the first mountain in jiu-jitsu if you get your black belt, then you're gonna descend into the valley and you're like, holy shit, what am I doing? I'm not even a black belt. Look at all these other amazing black belts. Then you get on the second mountain, you start giving back to people. And then it becomes this wonderful, wonderful thing. So. What's up, everyone? Today I have a very special guest, and uh, Mr. Mike Bates. He is a Gracie Baja black belt over in the UK. He owns his own academy. He is a former Royal Marine for the Royal Marines, obviously. <laughs> and then he's also a successful entrepreneur. He is writing a book, Jiu Jitsu Practitioner, like I mentioned, devoted father or husband. He is an incredible wealth of knowledge. Uh, if you guys haven't heard about him rowing across the Atlantic, by solo for 46 days he's done that this man has accomplished so much in life and i wanted to talk to him about his project next 45 jujitsu life and and everything in general and i think anyone that is a parent or a father or jujitsu practitioner a, a, anyone is going to get a ton of value out of this and i it was a, a phenomenal conversation so all of his links are going to be down in the description below. Make sure you guys go check them out. Make sure you guys check out the sponsor. Make sure you guys join the Facebook group, L Bros over on Facebook. Also, don't forget, I got I got my new shirt. I'd rather be rolling. I'd rather be rolling t-shirt on right now. If you guys want that, elbowstight.com. And yeah, guys, let me know what you guys think about this. I appreciate you guys so much. And we'll catch you later. Peace. All right, Mike, Mr. Mike Bates, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, like I kind of alluded to right before I pressed record, I'm super excited about this conversation. You are you seem like an incredible person from your accolades and what you've accomplished in life. And I'm so excited to talk to you about today. How are you doing today, man? I'm good, mate. Thank you. We've just been talking off air, weren't we, about the weather. I think it's evening time for me, morning for you. Yeah. Both of us have got rain and clouds, so... Uh... Hopefully the conversation will be brighter, mate. I'm excited to speak to you today. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I don't understand the Pacific North weather or Pacific Northwest weather. Like it was 90 degrees yesterday. Today it's outside. It's cloudy and and rainy. And I'm like, I, I don't even understand this. It's it's a it's a crapshoot. Whenever you wake up in the morning, like, do I need to wear a jacket or not? Like, am I going to be able to go run outside or not? Like, it's 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 all over the place. I feel like, especially in the summertime, it's like, come on, man, can we just get these beautiful sunny days? Like, where are those at? Like, let's let's just have those. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, look, I'm I'm from the north of England, so uh, you know you get used to it, man. If you want sun, you have to travel. You know that's just the way it is. <laughs> Absolutely. But hey, let's go ahead and uh, jump in, into our conversation today. Mike, you, like I mentioned before, like you are just seem like an incredible person with all the things that you've done. You're former Royal Marine. You worked for the Ministry of Defense, Jiu Jitsu Black Belt, rode across the Atlantic by yourself, author, entrepreneur, devoted father, husband. I mean, just the list goes on and on. And what I want to ask first is what are some things, what is, what is something that uh, outside of all these these accolades and accomplishments, what's something that you you want to bring light to that most people might not know about you that you think is just as important as all these other things? Oh, that's a great first question. Um, let's not make it about me. Let's make it about everybody else. The thing I want everyone to hear from me is that you have to live a life without limits. You know, that's what my base stands for. That's what I do. I mean, the people helping business and everyone who's listening, I just want to tell them that you've got the opportunity to do whatever you want in life. And I know people have heard that over and over again, but I'm a kid from a, a working class background, broken home, drugs, 15, arrested, in prison for a little bit, you know, just for a night or two, and then managed to pull myself around from a lot of luck and good judgment. But I think what I've learned over the last 43 years of my life is that you're only going to get one shot, man. And so you've got to trust in yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to set yourself some goals. You've got to go out and live that life without limits. So that's before we say anything else, that's what I want your listeners to hear. Absolutely. And one thing you talk about too is you, you kind of alluded in there is um, 
setting big goals. And one thing that you talk about big goals is telling other people to that way you're accountable for them. And the first time I heard this is actually my buddy, Billy, who is a former army green beret. He did like 24 years in the army as a green beret, super accomplished man also. And I thought it was so interesting that he told me that as well. And he was like, you know, if you, t the more people you tell, the more people that you're going to be accountable to. And I always thought it was kind of different because I always thought like if I told people that's kind of me already with the sense of accomplishment, like I've done something, it's kind of like that reverse psychology. Like, well, now I don't really have to do it because I told everyone I was going to do it. But you talk about like tell more people because it makes you more accountable to it. How did you come to that, con that, that mindset? Yeah, well, I read a statistic once that said that 92% of the goals are never achieved. And the reason they're not achieved in the main is because no one ever starts. You know, everyone talks a good game. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go do this. You know, if I had, if I had a, a British pound or a dollar for every person I'd met who said, oh, I was going to join the Royal Marine Commandos or I was going to do this or I was going to row an ocean. Like, people talk a lot. What I'm trying to say is it's not about the talk, it's about the action. But in order to do that, you've got to have what I call nerve. And we can talk about my principles for goal setting in a little while if you want. But the N in my mind principles is nerve. And the nerve to say... I'm at this point in my life and I'm putting a flag in the sand over there. I'm going over there. I'm doing this. It doesn't matter how big that or small that goal is, but by telling other people, it gives you that accountability and allows you to believe just for a moment that it's even possible. So I was telling people for years I was going to go write a book. I was telling people for years I was going to go row an ocean. I was like, Mike, no one's ever done that. No one ever done your job and written a book like you're going to write. No one's ever done it. Can't be done. I'm like, it's going to be done. And guess what? We're going to do it. So it's, telling people is a great way to build confidence for you and to build that um, accountability through others. Support for today's episode comes from Marine Layer. It's official. I found the softest t-shirt mankind has ever made. Imagine the softest thing you've ever touched. Maybe kittens or freshly fallen snow. Now times that by 1000. Marine Layer is the go-to brand for great fitting and stylish closet staples. Based out of California, Marine Layer clothes are the perfect mix of laid back style and also looks and feels premium. What I love about Marine Layer is how their t-shirts stay soft no matter how many times you wash them. It's time to invest in the wardrobe that will actually last. For a limited time, our listeners get an exclusive 15% off discount with the code elbows type 15 at marinelayer.com. As a dad and a husband, I rarely buy myself new clothes, but when I do, I want to make sure that they're quality. Marine Layer accomplished that and more. They have great bundle deals on t-shirt, socks, shirts, and much more. Also, not only is the quality great, but they also have in-between sizes and athletic fits as well. How many times have you felt that you were in between sizes when buying clothes? Maybe you've been drinking uh, a few too many lately, or you've been hitting the gym extra hard. You finally no longer have to make that difficult choice between medium and large, and large and extra large. Now, look no further than Marine Lair. For a limited time, get 15% off with the code ElbowsTight15 at MarineLair.com. That's ElbowsTight15 for 15% off your entire order at MarineLair.com. Saving your closet one shirt at a time. So when, when it came to your jiu-jitsu journey, was, was that mindset of setting a big goal of becoming a black belt always there? Or was it kind of like, you did it because of the Royal Marines and you just had fun doing it. I know you had a bad experience when you first started and then you came back around to, uh, to, to jujitsu a second time. And how, how has your goal setting for a jujitsu been from the beginning? Well, my goal when starting jujitsu is to try and stay alive in the Tora Bora caves with the Taliban. So we were going out to Afghanistan in 2002 as the first conventional British troops taken over from the 10th mountain division, actually the Americans. And uh, we knew we were in the Tora Bora region. We knew there were the cave complexes. And so a few of us were like, man, we've got to learn how to fight with our hands. You know what I mean? Like, we can't use weapons in these caves. So there's a guy who was fighting semi-pro MMA at the time. And we're talking like 2000, so way back, 2002. Um, 20 God, God, years ago now. So my initial goal was just to be able to defend myself and to be able to be the best possible soldier I could be. The thing that put me off jiu-jitsu for a little while was it, it wasn't really established here in the UK, right? Like, same as America. I'm like, talking early 2000s. Mm -hmm. It's not like it is now. So 
I tried to find jujitsu right. outside of the Marines and I couldn't find anywhere that was decent. They were all really kind of like dirty gyms, fight club. I got beaten up a load of times, got my arm popped. I'm like, the guys, this jujitsu? Mm. I don't think I like it. And then I kind of came back around. But the thing about jujitsu that I found, it might be the same with you, man. It's it's under your skin. Once you've once you've rolled, there's something that's under your skin that you need to do it. And so I kept having this feeling that I need to get back on the mat. I want to train jujitsu again. And it was a chance kind of moment. I was working operationally and I pulled around the corner into this car park and there was a sign that said MMA. And I was like, man, that's the day. So I just walked in and uh, the rest is history, man. So how long uh, after you started jujitsu, did you feel like you were, I always talk about like six months, like you would probably kick your your former self's ass if they were to walk into the gym, right? How how long after you started jujitsu did you feel like you accomplished your your I would stay alive in a hand to hand situation? Uh, not for a long time, because again, back in the early two thousands, the information around jujitsu was so difficult to get a hold of. Like there was like in yeah. two thousand, Mauricio Gomez, Roger Gracie's dad, had come to the UK. He was the only black belt in the UK. Like there was, there was no one else, in, you know, for, for miles around. So um, I, I don't think I was thinking about it in that way. I think when I became a blue belt after having trained for about 18 months, I think I felt at that point I was competing quite a bit. I think at that point I thought, I'm all right. What I see interestingly with my students now, because they get, in my own academy, they get me every day. They get high-level coaching, amazing seminars and stuff all the time and YouTube and everything else. I actually think that six months yeah. thing could come a bit closer, man. I think if you came into our academy mm. and we cloned you, four weeks later, you would absolutely batter that that clone because we can give you so much information so quickly that's just going to elevate you to a level where no one can touch you when it comes to fighting and grappling that it's completely changed the game, man. Yeah, there's like such a wealth of knowledge nowadays too. And like I'm sure like you you can attest to this when you first started back in jujitsu, all the people that I hear that talked or started back in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was this whole dogma mantra of like, you don't talk about what we do in this academy. You don't spread that information. You know what I mean? Like at what point did you think that started to kind of shift? Was it like the how when the internet started getting more popular or like instructionals magazines started to get more popular? When did you see that kind of like get pushed to the wayside. No, I'll tell you exactly what it was because it's, it's a vivid memory. So you're absolutely right. I mean, we did a podcast the other day <laughs> in our academy with a guy called Adisa Banjoko. You should have on the show if you haven't had him on. Shout out to Adisa. He's a great guy. Bishop yeah, Chronicles yeah. on Instagram. Black belt under uh, Alan Gumby Marcus. And he said, um, we well, were talking about the, the word crayonche because when I came through jiu-jitsu, the word mm-hmm. crayonche or traitor was a thing. Like you did not leave your team for any other team because – like you say, man, no one shared information. There was no central repository on the internet. Mm-hmm. So what your school did was what your school did, and, and that was it. Um, but it has changed, and I think that's a good thing. Um, just going back to your question, for me, really now, like, the moment that got me, mate, was my professor, Victor Estima, who's a wonderful man, head of Gracie Baja for Europe. I remember him coming into an academy, and I, I still can't believe it. he stood in front of everybody and we were paying five pounds a session. There was no membership fees. The heating wasn't on. It was a horrible place. And he stood in front of us all and he said, Jiu Jitsu is going to change. And this is back in, I'd like to say, 2010. And he said, Jiu Jitsu is going to change. There's going to be academies where it's premium, it's beautiful, there's showers, there's you know, beautiful mats, they're clean, there's staff. There's, and we were like, man, no, it's five quid and you kill each other. Like, that's just the way it is. But he had this <laughs> vision through, you know, Carlos Gracie Jr., Gracie Baja, of making jiu-jitsu for everyone. And I remember that day, man, and uh, such a such a great leader, Victor. Um, that moment's really stuck with me. Yeah, I, I talked to uh, Gustavo Dantes, who is fifth degree black belt been doing jujitsu since like i don't know 88 i think he said and he said you know with the introduction like the ibjjf is like kind of like when they started to realize like 
oh man, like there's there's something more here. We should probably start, you know, being a little bit more serious about this. And then also the uh, Brazilian championships down in Rio de Janeiro was another big turning point too. And it's it's so interesting now. It's like you mentioned, there's just, there's so much information out there and there's so many people that are able to, you know, persuade and uh, kind of like, feel like they're they're legitimate without any any way of knowing for sure or not when your students come to you and especially white belts because I know as a white belt I was I was information hungry when you when you come to when it comes to your students wanting more information how do you tell them to kind of like weed through the the good and the bad do you have like specific people that you recommend or do you have like specific uh ways for them to gather information the only the only thing I ever tell my students is to do two things, and that is to turn up to class and to be a good person. That's it, and leave the rest to us. Like jujitsu should be fun more than anything else, and if we want people to stay on the mat for mm. the longest amount of time, and that's where the real magic happens, I believe. I've been doing it now for twenty odd years. The longer you're in it, the better it becomes, um, and because of the relationships that you've built right around the world and with your students and your your teammates. So that's all I tell them, man. And I just say, just come to class and just enjoy it. Don't put any pressure on yourself. You know, it, it never ceases to amaze me how white belts are their own worst critic. I can't do jujitsu. This guy's better than me. It's like, you're not even qualified to know. You've been doing it for six months. You don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so just come in, enjoy it, lose. And I'll tell you what, this is the interesting thing. And we, we you know, this is, it's cliche almost in jiu-jitsu to say this, but like the mat is a mirror, right? To the person's character. I think I love to see mm-hmm. how we can develop people through jiu-jitsu. That's what my business does at Grace of Our Own Elites. You know, we're uh, we're in the people development business, man. We just use jiu-jitsu as a tool to do it. Um, so for me, it's about changing people's character, making them the kind of people that can have a really positive ripple effect into the community. What One thing you talk about also... Uh, quite a bit is having positive role models for like young men so they can look up to someone who was the first person that you found as a positive role model that kind of like changed who you are as a person. Yeah. It's a guy called Steph Moran. Um, he was my sergeant in the Royal Marines when we went to Afghanistan in 2002. Phenomenal leader. Um, he actually became, I met him last year uh, because it was a 20 year reunion from when we went to Afghanistan. I've not seen him since. So I've not seen him for 20 years, this guy. And he rose to the highest non-commissioned rank in the Royal Marines, Regimental Sergeant Major. Of four, oh, five, nice. Three, and he was, his most proud achievement in all that 22-year career was bringing a whole unit of Marines back alive from Helmand, and it had not been done. And the only reason, he was the only guy who could do that because people listened when Steph spoke. And they listened because he was the kind of leader that led with some real authenticity. And he went out there and did it. And you followed him, man. It was a wonderful uh, experience to go and soldier under and alongside a man like that. And I've taken so many lessons from him. Fresh ball fall is upon us and you need to be in the festive spirit. Light a candle and get some pumpkin spice and make sure your balls look nice with today's sponsor, Manscaped. Nature may clear the leaves for their trees, but you'll need Manscaped to get ready for that sweater weather. Get your pants puppies prepared for cuffing season with a trim that's refreshing as the fall breeze going to manscaped.com using code ETP20 for 20% off and free shipping. I remember the first time I trimmed my balls uh, and it was a nightmare. To give a visual idea of how bad it was, my balls looked like Jim Carrey's The Grinch when he shaved his face for the first time. Now, instead of hearing, look at that hack job in my head, now I hear, oh, those are some good looking jewels. But now you've heard of them. But it's time you join the 9 million men worldwide using Manscaped to get the kit that covers it all, the Performance Package 4.0. Bring the fall in right and get 20% off and free shipping with code ETP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using code ETP20. As the leaves fall, make sure you have it all with Manscaped. What what lessons have you taken from him, and do you apply it to young men that come and look for uh, guidance through you, through jujitsu or your program like Next Forty Five? Like, how, what what uh, lessons do you kind of like apply to yeah. your own leadership style? There's, there's now? so many. There's so many, man. I'll talk leadership specific. So I have to think of the three C's in leadership. 
courage, you know, and that's to take the tough calls, right? To make the tough decisions, to plant the flag in the sand, like I said, in a place where you don't even know if you can get there. But leaders have the courage to be able to do that. You need clarity in the way you communicate. Um, and that's so important. And I think that's where great leaders can elevate to become the very, very best. Um, because they can they can articulate their intent and their vision to their people. And that's what builds that trust and gets people going. And then the final one is credibility. And that's not about experience. You don't need to be experienced to be a great leader. When I talk to businesses, I say everyone in the room is a leader. But you need the credibility through your own actions. You know, living the values that you hold most dear every single day of your life, being authentic about that and doing it because it's the right thing to do because you believe in it, that builds credibility. So courage, clarity, credibility. If you've got those things, you can lead, man. Simple as that. Are those something, when you when you look to promote uh, to higher ranks in jiu-jitsu, are you kind of trying to instill those values into the ranks of jiu-jitsu also? I asked Roy Dean this, and you know, when you become a black belt in the academy, not all black belts are good people. We obviously know that. There's already there's a there's a big thing going on in the jujitsu community right now, as of like last night. But what what qualities do you look for when you're when you're promoting people, like personally, not not necessarily technically, but like personally? Yeah, man, you're so right. Like, well, character's huge, isn't it? So I always say to anybody I give a blue belt to. Um, because that's the first big promotion, right? The first big step. I always mm -hmm. say that invisibly written on the inside of that blue belt is my name. And next to that is Victor Estima's name. And next to that is Zeha Diola and Carlos Gracie Jr. And Hollis Gracie. Like, you know, you're part of the lineage. You know, we've just installed in our academy this yeah. beautiful chronology of jiu-jitsu that follows you up the stairwell as you come up. And it starts with, you know, back in... Aztec days when people were grappling in caves and it ends with your next class. Like you are part of so the lineage of jiu-jitsu oh, cool. jiu jitsu being spread. So for me, if I'm promoting anybody and putting my name next to them, they have to be good people. Man, if they're not, if they're not good people, they don't train with us. It's simple as that. Um, we have to have this community first, being there for other people mindset. And if you do that, you'll go as far as you need to go, man. In in your twenty one years uh, of doing jujitsu and and being on the mat, how has your 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 mindset changed when it comes to promotions? Do you feel like jujitsu is kind of being watered down? Is it easier to get a blue belt now than it should be, or like how how do you navigate uh, promotions like that? It's not easier. Uh, I think it just takes less time because information is more readily available. Training partners are better. There's more of them. There's black belts everywhere now. Like I said, when I started, man, there was one black belt in the UK and two and Roger K. That was it. And Brawley or that, that, that was it. So, you know, I think it just takes quicker, but I think the standards should remain the same. And um, there are people in our community, and I say that worldwide, as you know, and you'll know some, who they're not doing jiu-jitsu the justice it deserves by handing out belts, promoting people who pay money rather than have achieved a certain level. And I think that undermines what we're all about. So certainly in our academy, we're, you know, I've, I promoted a guy to Blue Belt last year. It took him two years. Two years to get to Blue Belt. He had to lose 30 kilos. He had to, you know, gain some courage and some um, inner strength. And it took him a long time. Man, I ain't going to give it out because, as I said, my name's on the inside of that belt. And if anyone asks who gave yeah. you your blue belt and you're not a good person, they're going to say me and they're going to say my professor and he's going to come and looking for me. So it has to be. It has to be <laughs> right. Yeah. You mentioned that at Blue Belt, you or when you first started, you started competing a lot. How, do you like a, not not push it, but do you promote competing quite a bit? And what is the comp competition scene like in the UK? I'm sure it's much better now, obviously, like you, we keep mentioning them before. But is it something you you push on your students? Don't push it, but I offer it. So we have a competition class, um, and we I mean we train hard anyway. The standard in the academy is really high. We're the largest Brazilian Jiu Jitsu academy in the north of England, probably one of the largest in the country now. Nearly five hundred students. Um, we win wow. most of the local tournaments in terms of like the team. 
Um, if not win it, we're in the top three usually. Um, and then we've got guys who've gone and won British championships. Um, and none of these are full-time competitors. The thing I try and offer to my students is a chance for them to develop again. So I do I do think when you compete, you expedite your learning in jiu-jitsu and you're learning about yourself exponentially. So you know, if I'm, if someone said to me, I want to get better, I'm saying, you've got to compete because that's the only way to fast track because you're going to highlight all of your weaknesses and now you know what you need to work on. And that might take you months in the academy to figure out. So I don't push it, but I encourage it. And um, yeah, we've got some amazing competitors, man. I'm very proud of them. 500 people. That's a lot of people in an academy. Like <laughs> that's, that's a lot of people. And you mentioned your uh, Gracie Baja affiliate. Now, I don't. I don't want to to bash on Gracie Baja, but you obviously see all the memes online about Gracie Baja and stuff like that. How how do you take all that stuff? Do you kind of like um, just brush it off or whatever, right? Because a lot of people don't like the uniforms that they, they don't they don't like the requirements and stuff like that. How do you view all that stuff? Yeah, it's it's what I love about Gracie Baja, to be honest. So. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. Here, when people actually go there, yeah, five hundred <laughs> students, man. We've only been open two and a half years. Like we were a new academy, right? But it's gone big. It would not have got that big if it wasn't within the Gracie Baja structure, and it's the organization of Gracie Baja that I like. Um, that's what I like in terms of uniform. Like, it's a great point. You know, on my mats, everyone is equal. When I first started training, I used to go buy show you all geese. I'd save up, I'd buy a show you roll gi. No one had one. You had to get them shipped from the US. Really cool. And then a guy would turn up with a you know, $20 karate gi. And you, you just, there's already a class system emerging here. I want everyone to be equal on the map. Mm, and that unity of the team, of everyone wearing the same uniform and turning up is key, I think, to really illuminating the character on the mat again. So it's not about how much money you've got. It's not about what gear you're wearing, what color it is. It's about being together and doing it together. And I think that kind of jujitsu for everyone mantra that Gracie Baja talk about, um, I really like it. I've, I've fallen foul of, you know, online trolls, man. You know, it's going to happen. People, but no one talks of the unsuccessful. That's one to someone told me once. And, you know, it's when they stop talking about you, that's when you got to be worried. Yeah, I always, I always talk about um, people, people, successful people don't talk down, right? Unsuccessful people talk up. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if that. if you are successful, people people are are gonna you know want to talk down to you and like say things to you because uh, whether they're envious or not, um, you know what I mean? Like, if you're successful, you don't. There's no reason for you to look down on someone. You know what I mean? Like, you're you're you most of the time you want to help people, and it seems like you're kind of like that that person too. And that's kind of the reason why you did the uh, the solo Atlantic row, right? Is because you wanted to raise money for uh, for charity, right? Yeah. So my youngest boy was um, well. Both my children were born early. In fact, I've just seen my youngest boy come back from jujitsu. He just walked up the garden path in his gi. Um, so yeah. So he he was born nine weeks early. He weighed three pounds. He was see through. You could see straight wow. through him. And he couldn't breathe, right? So he was on life support. He was ventilated. And then we got him home after about four or five weeks of being in intensive care. And he was sleeping a lot. And I was saying to my wife, look, this is good. He's growing. He's sleeping. He's catching up. And she was like, I've just got a funny feeling something's not right. So I said, listen, go take him to hospital. I'm going to go. I had to go follow a terrorist around all day. That's what he used to do for a job. And um, she rang me. She said, you need to come back because, uh, and I walked in into this room and he was on this table and the consultant said, if you didn't bring him in today, he'd have been dead tomorrow. He had meningitis. So then he was back in intensive care with meningitis for five to six weeks, lumbar puncture, said he had brain damage, then he didn't. And um, thankfully, he's now a very healthy, happy boy. But one thing I realized, Travis, whilst we're in that experience, and it's not until you're in somewhere like intensive care with children that you understand this, certainly in the UK, the NHS, we've got a fantastic healthcare system, right? Um, but they do not fund the specialist equipment that these poorly babies need. Charities do. And so I just had this weight on my shoulders that I felt I wanted to repay the debt 
that those doctors, nurses, and those people had given us as a family. And so that's why I went to row an ocean on my own, um, because I wanted to raise the most amount of money as I could for other families like us. So you did, it took a uh, three years, you raised 175,000 euros. What, what was that feeling like when you finally, everything was in line and you're like, holy crap, I ra- that's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Like, what was that feeling like? Uh, pride. I mean, I handed over a check for 137,000 pounds to the hospital um, two months ago. We funded the purchase of six neonatal monitoring machines for that unit, the same unit the -the state-of-the-art machines that are going to keep children alive. And we've given money to other parts of the hospital as well. Yeah, a real feeling of pride. But you know what? A real feeling of, not pride just in the money we raised, but in how we did it. When I speak about this solo ocean row, I always say it was a solo row, but a team effort. You know, it took everybody involved to make it happen, from my coaches, sponsors, family, friends, like everybody, right? So the pride I feel is pride in them as well playing their part in creating this amazing campaign, the Atlantic Grappler campaign that I'm so proud of. What what was one of the first hardships that was that you had to face for the Atlantic row and like how'd you overcome it? Well, I mean it was tough, man. Forty six days, six hours and ten minutes alone in the middle of the ocean is it's not easy, man, I'm telling you. It was the hardest thing I've ever done by a mile. Like it's so tough. I mean after 24 hours, even though I'd done 200, more than 200 hours of training at sea in my boat, I was really well prepared. I'd trained in the gym for three years. I was really, I was probably, I felt I was the most prepared guy in the fleet. Um, and, um, but after 24 hours, every joint on both hands were blistered. So basically I had two massive blisters mm. for hands. And I was still having to row into a headwind in 20, 30 foot seas. And I was rowing for 14 to 17 hours a day, every single day. Uh, Most of that unbroken, um, just stopping to eat. So, and then I slipped over on deck on day two and damaged a ligament in my knee, which meant I couldn't bend my knee. So now I was rowing on one leg for a week. Mm. So I had one leg, uh, no hands, but you have to do it, man. Like, what's the alternative? So um, that was the first hardship. But the hardest thing um, about doing anything like that was the solitude. Like, as humans, we are not good on our own, man. And anyone who's out there who thinks, oh, no, I can do this on my own. No, you can't do it on your own. All good things are done with people and with others. And I, I just longed for human connection every day. I was talking to every bird that I flowed past, the moon, the stars, just trying to connect to something, man, you know, bigger than me. And it taught me a really valuable lesson in life. And that is... This stuff that we're doing now, mate, the people listening to your podcast, the connection between humans is what matters. Nothing else matters. Only that. Do you do like a a kind of solitude retreat regularly now? Like yearly, we, me and my old co-host, we have a group of friends that we go floating down uh, a river in the Pacific Northwest for seven days. No technology just fishing, camping, floating down the river. And I'll tell you what, the first year we did it, it was such an incredible experience, like completely disconnecting from the world for seven days. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't believe how good I felt afterwards. Like I got to see wild animals. I was in the wilderness. Beautiful. I would highly recommend to everyone. Is that something you do regularly now? I mean, there's two things that I think what you're describing is disconnecting from technology and disconnecting from the business of the world. You're still with people though, right? So there's, there's two different things here. Right. Like true solitude is there's no one. I don't advocate that as a res- recipe for like success because as I said, you need people. For short periods of time, I still do. So I went away. I felt kind of overwhelmed a few months ago. I don't mind saying this, like got a lot of businesses going, lots of things happening. I just couldn't handle the pressure, man. So I, I went away to a, a little hut in the middle of nowhere in the Lake District on my own for 48 hours and just read books and walked up mountains, man. Um, and I needed it. And like you, I came back refreshed, re-energized, recharged. Um, I think it's good for people to disconnect, to get off the phones and be present for whatever they're doing. And that's a skill that has to be learned. You've got to learn how to do that. 
Um, but in terms of being on your own, alone, alone, not many people can do that, man. Yeah, it's definitely, it's uh, something, I, I, I mean, especially being around people so much, I think maybe a day or two, you know what I mean? And then it's like, the silence is kind of deafening. You know what I mean? It's like, where I need, I need my kids. I need, I need something. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you, you talked about, uh, you got on your Instagram, you did this beautiful recap of the lessons learned from the ocean. And I kind of just want to touch a little bit on those and, and how, how you came up, uh, up with these, these lessons. So number one is show up, be yourself and be your authentic self. Like where, where did that come from in your experience on the ocean? Well, because there's, you know, when you, when you're stripped to the bone, because you've not slept, like I didn't sleep more than 20 minutes, um, in one go really. Um, because I was having to wake all the time to check the boat. Weather was massive. When you're stripped to the bone with sleep deprivation, with loneliness, you know, you you look at yourself, you, you understand yourself, man, deeply, you know, and it is about you then. It's not about anybody else. I think a lot of people in life, unfortunately, are living through extrinsic motivations. So they want likes on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. They want to do this. They want to drive this car. You've got to start to look inward, have some introspection and say, okay, who, who am I? Who, who the hell am I? And who do I want to be? Because we've got, that is a choice and we've got the choice to do that. But far too many of us don't think that way. So yeah, be your authentic self is about just being you, being proud of it for all your flaws, all your vulnerabilities. I talk about this for men a lot. You know, I cried every day on the ocean. Um, you know, that's, there's, I'm not ashamed to say that, man. You know, that's just the way it is. And um, yeah, being you is, is the most important thing. I think you, you said something very powerful there too, is it's something that I'm trying to do with my sons, my teenager and my toddler. Um, is allowing them to be okay with being themselves and whether it's emotional or not, right? Uh, I'm sure, especially with your generation, with my generation, um, you know, it's it was kind of frowned upon to have like emotions as a man. You know what I mean? Like they're like, uh, you know, obviously growing up, like don't be a sissy, crying's for girls, all that, all that stuff. And now I'm trying to change that with my son. Like I'm trying to validate his feelings so he doesn't feel like he has to suppress them. You know what I mean? Because feelings are real, whether you're a man or woman, like your feelings are real. And, uh, I, I don't, I feel bad for, you know, if I try to like belittle my son for being upset about something, both of my sons, you know what I mean? For being upset about something. How, how has, uh, that first lesson translated into like being a father? Yeah, it's about communication. I think it's about, about talking to your children and, and, and also, setting the example so you know they've seen me crying on instagram when i'm rowing across the ocean they've seen me suffer in the gym every single day and they've seen me fail and they've seen me succeed and i think if you demonstrate that to your children and they see that the world doesn't end when no one likes your post or you can't complete whatever it is you try and set yourself um, I was just listening back to uh, the Teddy Roosevelt, the Theodore Roosevelt, the man in the arena talked. I mean, he talks about, you know, if you fail, as long as you fail while daring greatly, that's all that matters. So I think setting an example to your children by doing it, being authentic, and then communicating that to them is absolutely key. Yeah, and, and another one that you talked about is uh, stop playing games you can't win. Um you were you talked about the summit of the first half of your life, and I thought that was a, another another great one because I feel like a lot of people nowadays kind of set these un unrealistic expectations on themselves and then put all this extra stress on themselves. And you know they're like, oh man, I'm I'm 30 years old, like I should be X, Y, and Z, or I should have all this and that. And like you kind of just you talk about the summit of the first half of your life. Can you like talk talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, so I read a great book called Second Mountain by David Brooks, and he, he articulates this really well. And he describes it as life is two mountains. And the first one is, when I talk about games, it's the mating game, it's finding a mate, it's the status game, it's the corporate game. You know, we're playing all these games. None of them matter, by the way, but when you're that age, 
in your twenties, you know, thirties, whatever, that that does matter to you, and that's natural. But what happens is people get to the summit of that first mountain, and about my age, about 40, 43, and the view they're expecting or that they've told themselves they're going to have probably isn't the view that they've got. And what happens then is they descend into the valley between the two mountains, and that is the kind of archetypal midlife crisis. You know, you go buy a sports car, you leave your wife, you know, you change it, all that, and you're just in a mess. What you've got to try and do is get onto the second mountain. And that is the moral existence, as David Brooks calls it. That is helping people. That's being a leader. That is doing good for your community. That is faith. That is family. Those are the things that matter. No one's going to care less what rank you were in the military or what position you held in in a corporate organization on your final day. No one's going to care. What they care about and what you're going to care about is who's there with you. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across in Next 45 is we're trying to give men the opportunity to look ahead and say, what do I want my next 45 years, my last 45 years to look like? Because you can do it. You can make that decision now and you can go and achieve whatever you want to achieve. But but most people, Travis, aren't thinking that way. They're in the, the they're on the hamster wheel, man. They're just driving to work. They're coming home, going to bed. They're driving. They need to wake up. You've only got one life. You've got to live it without limits, man. You've got to get on with it today. Oh, there's the great points. And I'm glad you brought up Next 45 because that's where I wanted to go. Next is kind of talk about Next 45. Can can you explain to people at home what Next 45? So my 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 demographic is is typically uh, late 20s to mid 40s is my biggest demographic area in men. And so I think the the Next 45 is, a, is something that a lot of people can can relate to. Can you uh, talk a little bit about it and how you, why it started? Yeah, man. I mean, it's the, when I left, I uh, did a 15 year covert career in the intelligence services and the MOD. And um, when I came out, the, the first business I, I registered was next 45 because I'd hit 40 myself and I knew it was difficult. And I thought, man, guys have got to be struggling like me, just trying to figure out who they were. And I think that's where the kind of idea of the ocean road started for me. Um, and then I started looking at the statistics for men, you know, three out of four men, three, sorry, three out of four people will kill themselves in men. The sweet spot for men killing themselves is 40 to 49 years old. One in eight men have a mental health issue. Men are the least likely to seek out, um, health interventions, more likely to undertake risk behaviors, drinking, drugs, porn, whatever. And I think societally we've, and we touched on this earlier, We've not done men a, a good service here because it's been a culture of man up, get on with it. You know, you're a guy, protect, provide. And that's tough, man, in midlife. So Next 45 is all about trying to help guys reframe what their life looks like, get them out of the valley and onto that second mountain where they can start to see life for what it really is. And that is, as I've said before, community a moral existence, helping others, family. And that's what we're trying to do, mate. So we've got our, our inaugural event happening in two weeks' time at the historic Howden Estate in Wales. Um, people can find out more about that on nxt45.com. And we're just putting out loads of good insights all the time on our Instagram and LinkedIn, just trying to help guys, man, and just trying to trying to do a, good, a little bit of good in the world. Where, where do you see the the next 45 and let's say, you know, three to five years, like what is, what is your, your goal for it? So I'd love for us to be the, the place that men go to. I'd like there to be a societal change around the conversation around men's health. I think we've had societal conversations around gender and race and equality and and me too and everything else. And quite rightly, those, those conversations needed to happen because they needed to be changed, but no one's talking about men. And so I think I'm hoping that in the next three to five years, we can start to change the conversation around men's health. And we say like, this is what a man is. You know, you can be a strong man and still cry, you know, but you can still strive as well and have all those masculine traits. That's absolutely fine. So I'd like to see that societal change. And then for next 45, I'd love it if we were able to hold a retreat in the U S in Australia, in Asia, yeah, that'd be cool. in the UK and broaden that out and have these amazing 
you know, three day retreats for guys where they can experience cold water, wild swimming, amazing speakers, fire cooked food, and a chance to, to our point before, just step away from technology for a few days and start to think about the man that they really are and the man that they want to be for everybody else. Yeah, I know there's a camp, uh, like the origin camp that's going on right now. Um, you know, it's it's probably predominantly male, but there's God, there's like 250 people there. It's incredible the amount of people that are at this event right now. And I had, I had kind of heard about it before, um, but you know, they had they're like out camping away from everyone, doing jujitsu and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, that would be so cool to go be around be around like-minded people that want to accomplish the same thing. And I think that's one thing that like jujitsu brings to the table is once you step on the mat, like to your point too, like it's a mirror of yourself, but also who you are outside the door kind of, kind of gets left because it, people don't talk about politics. They don't talk about all these arbitrary things in a day-to-day life. They, they, they're there for a common goal of improving themselves and, and getting better. And it's, it's, it's incredible to, to see the diversity of people that you get to go through these, these adversities with on a daily basis. It's something that I, I kind of like attribute to the closest thing to the military. I don't know about you, but like, it's like the closest camaraderie to the military that, that I've been able to experience as a, a veteran now. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, you, you nailed it there, mate. It's the, it's the shared adversity. That's the, that's the, the glue, you know, that's the thing the military have. That's the thing that, rugby has or NFL or or any any team sport where you have to suffer and put yourself on the line. Um, I think that's what brings people together through jiu-jitsu. The one thing I tell my students is that the, the quicker they can see jiu-jitsu as being something that is there to help or they're there to help others and not just themselves, that's when the magic really happens in jiu-jitsu. So when you're turning up to class not just because you want to train, but because you want to be a training partner for someone else. Now we're starting a really beautiful cyclical community that everyone's positive and everyone's there to help everyone. And that's what we have in our academy. And it's it's wonderful. And you hear stories all the time of people helping other people out off the mat. And, you know, it's it's lovely, man. I love it. What's up, everyone? Summer is upon us, and with hot summer nights come sleepless nights tossing and turning. That's why you need Mummy Pillow. With Mummy's six-chamber design and breathable mesh, no longer do you have to worry about that sweaty head getting stuck against your pillow, waking up tossing and turning trying to find a cool spot to refresh you enough to go back to sleep. Mummy Pillow has been phenomenal for my night's sleeps, and I cannot say enough good things about it. I go to sleep easier, I sleep more soundly, and I wake up with no neck pain. With Mummy's now patented in six chamber design, you never have to worry about your pillow's fluff going anywhere besides where it needs to. I literally put my head in one section and it stays there the entire time and it feels great. I absolutely love my Mummy pillow. I am so thankful that they reached out and gave me an opportunity to support the brand and support the podcast. If you guys haven't tried Mummy Pillow yet, I promise you you're missing out. Their products are great. Be sure to go to mvmisleep.com and use code elbows tight at checkout for 15% off and free shipping. Once again, that's mvmisleep.com and use code elbows tight at checkout. And also you have 30 days free return. So if it doesn't work out for you, then that's okay. You can send it back. No harm, no foul and no risks. Thank you, Mummy, for sponsoring this episode. That's one thing. I, I did a solo episode, and I was talking about um, in, in jiu-jitsu, it's very easy for us to get focused on our journey so much, and if, whether it's the highest of highs or the lowest of lows in our journey, and think about, oh, man, I don't want to do this anymore. That I'm having such a hard time, and you know, my, I'm not meeting my goals. And then I talk about how Maybe you should switch the goal, like to your point, helping others, right? There's a lot of sense of accomplishment in taking someone under your wing and helping them achieve their goals, you know, and it can kind of reignite that fire underneath you of like, all right, now I'm ready to do this. <laughs> I'm ready to help out. Do you get, how, how do you, uh, in your jujitsu journey, how did you overcome those, like those lows to, to continue to train? For me, jujitsu just keeps me honest. Like, you know, I, I am someone who's gone out and set big goals and 
and worked hard and achieved the things I wanted to achieve, I still tap, man. And I love that about jiu-jitsu. It keeps me really honest. I think just want to pick up on something you said there, Travis. I actually believe that there's a greater sense of accomplishment when you help others. Um, actually, when it's about other people and you're in the people helping business that I'm in, which is whether that's in public speaking, whether that's my jiu-jitsu academy, my book, this next 45, it's not about me. You know, the, the benefits to me will come, of course, you know, financially, if it goes well, that, that's all mine, but I'm in it to help other people. And that, that is a great feeling, man. When you put your head on the pillow at night and you know that you helped someone today and they're better because of you. So that's life, man. That is what life is all about. I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of people are missing nowadays. I feel like, uh, especially in the West, the sense of community is lost in a, in a lot of scenarios in life. And I feel like picking up a team sport or a martial art or like my wife does soccer, football. Uh, you know, she does it uh, a couple times a week here and there. She like substitutes for team and the the amount of joy she gets out of it and playing with, you know, being outside of the the mother figure. You know what I mean? She gets like a mental set and then gets to get some physical activity. And she has a blast doing it. She's always like, babe, do you mind if I go play soccer? I'm like, absolutely not. Go. Like, go get your break. You give me my break twice a week. And then, you know, you let me record the podcast where I get to talk to interesting people. Like, absolutely. Go get that sense of community. Go get, get that sense of camaraderie and that teamwork. And I feel like a lot of people are missing that nowadays. And once again, to your point, mental health, especially in men, where they they have a sense of being lost or the sense of no one cares or things aren't in, you know, no one finds the, them useful or anything like that. And I think martial arts is a great thing to, to bring all that back in to, into like level head people, you know, and my, it, it's helped me quite a bit. Yeah. The most powerful thing around that really is, is a book called man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. I don't know if you've read it, but if you've not, you should get it. And Viktor Frankl, um, was imprisoned in Auschwitz I'm gonna write that down. by the Nazis and um, he lived there and he was a psychologist. So he was able to study the human condition in the most horrendous circumstances. And there was a lot of luck to whether or not you lived or survived Auschwitz. I'm going this year actually to, to see the place for myself. Um, what he realized was the people who had something else to live for outside of Auschwitz, whether that was a person a loved one, or that was some unfinished business, a project, something, a dog, a cat, something to connect to that was bigger than you, those people are the ones who survived. The ones who didn't have that gave in because they only had themselves. I think that's the travesty of loneliness. He calls it the existential vacuum. It's when you don't have anything to be moving towards. You don't have a goal. You don't have a person next to you. You, don't. you have to have those things, man. I've been alone on the ocean for 46 days. I'm telling you, you need people around you. That's what life's all about. You need it. Yeah, and then also it, it helps if they're trying to choke you. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it makes a whole different. It makes a whole different experience. All on that one, so, man. I think that's, no, that's but I, I think. That's an important point, Travis, there. Go ahead. The, 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 the choking people, because what actually is happening there is I'm placing trust in you. And maybe you're a training partner that I don't know outside of the academy, right? You do a different job to me. You live somewhere else. We're never going to rub into each other in life at all. But for that moment, you've got your arms around my neck, and I trust that if when I tap, you let go. That's magic, man, because that is what humanity is all about. That's the human spirit. People are good. There's people are bad as well. We've all got that, both of those in us. But the goodness in people, the trust, is again, it's a magical thing to experience. I think that's what brings people together in jujitsu and creates those really unshakable bonds. Yeah, I, and I, it's it's cool too. Uh, to your point, because you don't. The the nice thing about training is if you're around good people, you can set as little or as many boundaries as you two agree on in that that role right if if you want to 
go 100% and you want to release and test yourself, you can do that. If you want to just flow roll because you're injured, you can do that. If you want to just watch people and ask questions, you can do that. And I think that's a beautiful thing because it, it allows everyone to uh, grow at their own pace and allow them to ease into it. Because we we always hear jujitsu is for everyone. And I kind of think that's kind of become a cliche. Like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of like these cliches in jujitsu. I think it is for everyone that wants it to be for them. You know what I mean? Like some people, I've had people that were that tried it and they just couldn't get over the uncomfortableness of being that close to someone, being vulnerable with people. And to me, sometimes you're just not going to overcome that. It's just not for them. And that's okay. You know what I mean? What are, what are some of these other cliches that you kind of hear in the jujitsu community where you're like, ah, that's kind of, it's kind of outdated. <laughs> Let, let's move, let's move past this whole idea. Um, I think we, I think jujitsu can be for everyone, but I think everyone's journey is unique. I think that's the that's the, the distinction we need to make. And I think you're on your own track with jujitsu, and when we're comparing ourselves to others and being inauthentic by doing that, that's when we can really come unstuck. And we talked about competition earlier. I don't believe you have to compete in jujitsu. I've met some absolute killers who would win British, European, World Championships on the mats who never compete. That we know of them, these these absolute beasts who live in the gym and they're just amazing. Like you don't have to compete to do that. Um, so that's one thing I want to stop. You don't have to be tough to do jujitsu, man. We've got students who, you know, female students, a lot of female students in our academy, children who aren't physically strong, but they're strong inside and they're able to withstand it. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've got guys who um, all come into the gym, big guys, fit, and they just can't handle the fact they're going to lose three times a week, every week for the mm. next 10 years or for the rest of their life. Cause that's just for some people, they can't handle it. I, I agree. It's definitely, it's something that uh, I've, I've become more accustomed to now that I'm getting older and my priorities in life have changed. I talk about uh, the different hats I wear in my life. Like my, my father and my husband hats are always going to be number one and two, then podcaster, content creator, jiu-jitsu practitioner in my life jiu-jitsu is just like it's a priority to me but it's not the highest priority to me anymore as you as you get older in life and your your hats kind of switch order how do you overcome that you know not getting beat but you know what i mean like tapping to uh lower belts or tapping to younger people or getting caught like how do you overcome that that because it can be kind of uh frustrating you know what i mean or it can be kind of you know um demoralizing for some people how do you overcome come all that listen anyone who say it hurts inside like because you are saying to somebody you better than me for that moment you know you got me right what i do is i shake my students by the hand and i say fucking well done you know because i feel pride <laughs> in the fact that they know how to do that because of me or because of us because of our team so you know, if my students aren't better than me, I've failed as a teacher. They ought to be better than me. Mm. One day they ought to be my teachers. And that's the day I'm looking forward to the most is when, in our academy, because we've only been open two and a half years, so everyone started at the same time, right? Like fast forward 10 years. Same with us. A hundred black belts, homegrown, trained together for 10 years, all sharing information. That's going to be the most beautiful magical environment for people to come into. So yeah, I, it's just ego, man. Ego is the enemy. You know, it, it's just, just, just you, no one cares. You know, I, I say that when we're doing specific training or competition, no one cares. No one cares if you win. No one cares if you lose. No one's counting. I can tell, I've tapped a million times. Couldn't tell you how many, like it doesn't matter. What matters is how you move forward from it. So, uh, what I was saying was how, how do you, how do you approach coaching recently? I've had the opportunity to start coaching at my Academy and I absolutely love coaching. I was a CrossFit and a weightlifting coach, uh, for years and the sense of accomplishment you get, like you mentioned to helping others and, uh, watching them being able to do something because, you know, you share the knowledge with them. How do you approach co uh, teaching in class? Like, there's the whole like ecological approach nowadays where it's more of like a game base. And then there's more the traditional way of, you know, X amount of times doing this technique. And how, how do you approach your class? Well, I mean, we follow the, the Gracie Bar curriculum, but of course, you know, 
I teach my own flavor of jujitsu. I think that's important. Um, I think there's there's a few elements that make a great class. Everyone should take at least one thing from it. So a really good instructor, I believe, even like we had like 40 people on the mat the other night. You know, I, I pride myself on trying to give each one of those people, regardless whether they're a purple belt or a white belt, something to take away. I believe there's there needs to be knowledge. People need to gain information. But there also needs to be an element of experiential learning. Where the, and I'm very concept and principle based when I talk about jujitsu. I want people to know why. Why is this grip the most dominant grip? Why, why is this position so important for you to understand? What's happening in this space? The experiential learning is key. And one thing you can't get from watching YouTube videos and BJJ fanatics and all that kind of stuff and doing it online is the experiential learning of, I'm going to try and unlock you from the closed guard. What happens when you move there? And what happens when you move there? And what happens when you do this and you do that? And you can only get that through years and years of experience. So I think a really good class has a mixture of all those things. It has something for everybody. It's fun. Uh, it, It challenges people. And it has knowledge. And it has the place for experiential learning where that is really encouraged by the instructor. Go do jujitsu. Go do it. You know, just go have a roll, man. See what happens. You learn so much. I'm going to steal a, a question that my buddy Adolfo says over, he always asks over at the Forever White Belt podcast. And what makes a good jiu-jitsu student? Well, I think the two things that I ask them all to be. You've got to be consistent. You know, jiu-jitsu progression is not linear. It comes in steps. You know, for, for, for maybe you drip, dock, dip a little bit, then you climb again, you know. But consistent training and a consistent good attitude to your own development and the development of others is the one thing that's going to carry you through. So I think that's extremely important. And the other is just to be a good person. Like, as again, like, I'm going to repeat myself here, but the sooner you can see jiu-jitsu as an opportunity to help others, not just you, that's when the magic happens. When you start coaching the kids' classes because you want to help the next generation, when you start you know, being a new kid for your instructors, that's the magic, man. So I would say a really good student is consistent. They turn up to training every week, even though they don't want to, they, they turn up. And they're a good person, and they put others first. Now, now for those out there, Mike's not saying if you're a brand-new white belt, start teaching other brand-new white belts techniques. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you do that in my academy, we are going to fall out. No, that's not going to happen. You You don't know how to do a rear naked choke. Don't try to coach me on how to do a rear naked choke. Okay. (laughs) Well, maybe we should, maybe we should put humility and humbleness in that, that uh, mix for the new one. (laughs) What I do say to my white belts, and this is true, is enjoy being a white belt because you, you, you're desperate not to be a white belt, but it's, it's the only time for my students. Anyway, I'm not going to have any expectations for them. Because they're supposed to be shit, and they are shit, and they know it, and I know it, so it's fine. So there's no pressure for you as a white belt. Just do it. When you're a blue belt, oh, now, you should be able to do a technical arm lock from the closed guard. You don't tap to pressure, you know, blah, 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 whatever those, those things are. So enjoy the white belt journey, man. That's what I'd say to anyone who's starting out. Dude, that's so true. I talk about this also is... John and I, my old co-host, we were like freaking dead set on getting our blue belts. We were training four or five times a week, watching instructionals, consuming as much jiu-jitsu content as possible. We went to Japan together, trained a lot there. And I mean, we were like, we got to get our blue belts. We got to get our blue belts. And I think we had about the same time. I think it was like 17, 18 months I got my, my blue belt. And that's also because I spent three months in Japan. And then once I got my blue belt, I was like, holy crap, like, I'm going to be here for a while. Like, why did I do that? Like, I should have just, I should have just went to class and enjoyed it and whatnot. Like, and you know, I'm very honest about it. My jujitsu journey has changed a lot since getting my blue belt and for better and for worse. And I, it's just something that hindsight 2020, looking back on me now, I would be like, man, just slow down a little bit. It's not, it's not as good as you think it's going to be once you get there. Cause it's uh, people, people talk about, you know, 
once you get a blue belt or a purple, brown or whatever, like, oh, no one below me should be submitting me anymore. It's like, look, you are the same exact person you were yesterday, just a different belt color around your waist. You know what I mean? Like, you're the person that gave you a hard roll yesterday is still going to give you a hard roll today. Like, it's, it's, it's not like you magically get superpowers the second you get your blue belt. You know what I mean? Like, as it's it's... Do you do you see that in your students sometimes when they get that that next belt color and they're they have like these these expectations of themselves to kind of put their belt on a pedestal that is a little bit unrealistic? Yeah. So w- the way I was came up through jujitsu was that you never ex- you never knew when you were going to get promoted, and you, it was never expected. You know, the moment I feel a student, because I'll know they're about there. The moment I feel I'm being comfortable where they are, they get a new belt. Because you're supposed to be uncomfortable. You're supposed to lose. He's still mm. not very good. I mean, look, the, but the whole idea behind this for me, and I try and espouse this to my students all the time, is like your goal in jiu-jitsu is to stay on the mat for as long as you can and build the best friendships that you can. Because if your goal's a blue belt, you'll get the blue belt and you'll leave. If your goal's the black belt, you get your black belt, you leave. Now, the journey starts again at Black Belt. I'm telling you, man, it's a whole different view of the world. You've reached the first mountain in jiu-jitsu if you get your Black Belt. Then you're going to descend into the valley and you're like, holy shit, what am I doing? I'm not even a Black Belt. Look at all these other amazing Black Belts. Then you get on the second mountain. You start giving back to people. And then it becomes this wonderful, wonderful thing. So, yeah, it's uh, it's always going to be complex because we're dealing with humans, man. But you've got to stick at it. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was a phenomenal conversation. Did not disappoint at all. I was super excited about this. Uh, and I, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. One question that we I like to ask before uh, or at the end of every podcast is, if you could give one piece of advice to a brand new white belt, what would it be? Enjoy it. I think if you're not enjoying what you're doing, uh, and that sounds like an easy answer, a stock answer, but it's not really. It's quite deep. You know, there's going to be times in jiu-jitsu where you're really struggling, where you're questioning yourself, when who you thought you were isn't the person you actually are because you lost your temper or you um, didn't react to a defeat or a, or a win in a certain way. You're going to be injured. It's going to be difficult. It's a hard, hard thing to do, jiu-jitsu. It's so hard. But if you enjoy it, if you set that flag in the sand, I'm going to do jiu-jitsu for 20 years. Boom. I don't care what belt I am. I'm just going to do it. Then you can enter into a most amazing... Probably I don't think there's anything that matches jiu-jitsu in terms of fulfillment. Like, I just don't see it. I've been in the military, man. You have. Like, it's good there's something extra that jiu-jitsu gives you. So the one thing I'd say is enjoy it and stick the course because it is worth it. Perfect. Mike, if people want to follow you and check you out, you have a brand new book coming out, like you mentioned. Where where can people find you and check out the book? And what's your book about? I forgot to ask about your book. Yeah, well, it's about the lessons I've learned from my previous career. So uh, I'm just finishing off the manuscripts. The Ministry of Defense don't want me to write it, but I do want to do it. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Hopefully it'll be out next year. Dates to be confirmed. Um, The best thing people can do is follow me on Instagram, Mike Bates underscore official. Um, There's a website coming out, uh, but everything I do is on Instagram. So yeah, or LinkedIn, Mike Bates, but Mike Bates underscore official on Instagram is the best place. Perfect. Hey, Mike, thank you again, once again, for coming on the show today, man. Uh, I can't wait for people to listen to this. And uh, there's just so much value that you you bring to to the Jiu-Jitsu community, man, just in life in general. And I just want to thank you once again for, for spending your time with me today. It's a pleasure, bro. One thing I do want to say to you, uh, apart from thank you for inviting me on is, and for any of your listeners, if they're ever in the UK, ever in England, and in a place called Leeds, You've got a place to train because one thing that Jiu Jitsu, we didn't speak about this but just to finish, has given me is a fantastic global community of people who all share the same values. So if you're ever near me, you hit me up on Instagram. You can train with me for free anytime. Perfect. 
I would love to come to the UK. I've never, I've always wanted to go. Me and my wife have talked about it. <laughs> we've never been on a honeymoon since we've been married. And so she's like, let's go to Europe. I was like, I'm down. Let's go to Europe. <laughs> so it might happen. Hey, it might happen. <laughs> so, all right. I, I appreciate it. So, hey guys, thank you so much for listening and watching at home. Make sure you guys go check out Mike. Everything's going to be down in the description below. And uh, we'll catch you later. Remember, no oil checks here. Peace.